All right. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, is my video and audio coming through? I just want a quick check before I start talking here. Looks good to me. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our session. Good morning from California. I think it's good afternoon for most of you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Giuliano Calio. I am a senior fellow at the Center for the Blue Economy and adjunct professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. And I'm the one of the co-founders and uh, the chief scientist at Virtual Planet Technologies. Uh, with us, we have Paulo Salvatore. He's, gonna, he's joining us from Sao Paulo in Brazil. He's our VR guru here. And he's also the other co-founder at Virtual Planet. And he has more than 10 years of experience in software and game development. And he's been teaching uh, virtual reality, VR, and um, artificial intelligence for the past five years. Uh, today, you also hear from Anna Queiroz. She's a postdoc at Stanford. She's at the Lehman Center and the Virtual Human Interactions Lab. And she's a leading expert in the use of virtual reality in environmental uh, and climate change literacy and education. And you also hear from Alisa Mann, uh, the Coastal Project Director at the Nature Conservancy, who's gonna talk to us about two projects here in California, one in Long Beach and one in uh, Paradise. So I just want a, a quick plug here before we start. We are all co-authors in, uh, in the study that was published at the Water Journal uh, last month, where we summarize you know, the findings from uh, our use of virtual reality in sea level rise planning and community engagement. There's also a great lit review in that paper about you know, uh, literacy and environmental literacy and ocean and, and other things related to um, climate change and uh, using VR as well. So I uh, encourage you guys to take a look at that. Uh, before we, we get into that, so just uh, what we're gonna do today, we have um, kind of an exciting program here. You actually will get to experience uh, three of these VR uh, tools. One, uh, and they're all related to communities that are already facing some impacts from climate change. And they're looking at a, a prospect of eventually having to relocate at least from parts of the community uh, uh, due to climate change in the future. So we're gonna go to Palau in Micronesia. We're gonna look at Long Beach and Paradise in California. And Paradise, it's a, it's a, a slightly different case because it's, you know, managed retreat being driven by uh, wildfires, right? So you're going to have to, you, you have the chance to watch those films as well. We're going to give you links so you could either watch this on your own because they're like, uh, two of these are 360 films, so you can actually drag and look around. Uh, but we'll also play them live for you here through the webinar, just in case your internet is not super fast or if you just want to follow us along. And then we'll give you the link so you can try them at any other time as well. So just setting the stage a little bit on the context of sea level rise and coastal planning, uh, this is how we typically communicate risks, right? We have this aerial image. Uh, it's a top-down view, a Google photo with some blue areas uh, depicting some sort of flood risk here. But there's growing evidence that these images are not super like the best or most effective way to communicate. So last year I stumbled upon this great research uh, done by Risa Palm and Toby Bolson from uh, Georgia State University, where they interviewed, uh, I think around a thousand um, uh, residents in Florida, and they show the maps to some of the residents, but not to others. And it was super surprising to me, but what they found is that the people that had seen the maps were less likely to say they believed that climate change uh, would, was taking place than those do, who had not seen the maps. And across the political spectrum, they found that there was no risk to their property values. So, and in reality, we know that that's not the case, right? Sea level rise is already affecting prices, uh, home prices in Florida and, and, and other places as well. Uh, so, and, and that's where kind of this idea of creating different ways to communicate came from. So I've been, uh, uh, this is Santa Cruz where I live. Uh, I've been flying drones here since 2016, I think. So one day I was out getting the shots to, to look at what the impacts of maybe the, the king tides would be on the, on the city. And it turned out it wasn't that impactful at that event, but I had this idea, what if we could use some of this uh, uh, great visuals as a communication tool to, to not only show some of the potential risks, but also some solutions to really inspire people to get more engaged with the issue. 
So from that idea, you know, I met Paulo and he's going to talk a little bit more about uh, our history together. But we designed the Sea Level Rise Explorer tools that include 3D models and also 360 aerial views like this one that you can see here. So this is a, a Santa Cruz boardwalk, the, the amusement park. And here you can see the impacts of just like 2.4 feet of sea level rise combined with an extreme storm. And one of the other things that I like to point out on this image is that the neighborhood right behind the amusement park, it's called the Beach Flats neighborhood, which is one of the poorest areas in the whole county here in, in Santa Cruz, very socially vulnerable, but also extremely uh, uh, exposed to coastal flooding. So uh, from since then, this has been going on since 2018, when we started, we're around uh, seven uh, cities right now and, and, and looking at others. And during this period, we, we published about 20 uh, versions of these applications and uh, you can get it on mobile, online, um, on VR headsets. If you have a, a, an Oculus Go or Quest headset, you can download this as well. And we've been taking them to some of the communities and, and, and some events. So just so very briefly why we're focusing on immersive solutions and Anna uh, is gonna talk a little bit more about that, but there's initial evidence that it promotes uh, pro-social behavior change. It increases preparation for natural disasters and intent to both evacuate from flood prone areas and purchase flood insurance. And our team, we've been talking with our colleagues a lot about this idea, how could this influence conversations about you know, managed retreat, which we'll, we'll, we'll hear a little bit more later. And there's evidence as well that interactive and, and images are more effective in communicating risk. And they can even weaken science politicization, which is a, a, a very critical issue around uh, managed retreat and climate adaptation in general, right? And also one other reason, I think it's still a very novel approach. So with that, we end up getting a lot of media attention. Uh, just a big shout out to the Columbia uh, conference here at what point managed retreat because uh, back two years ago, we were in New York. Uh, I can't wait to go back and have these things in, in person again. We're, we're nearly there. But that's uh, two years ago is when I met uh, Nathan Brock, which was a reporter with NPR, and, and he followed me to Long Beach and, and end up writing a story. And from that, other pieces came out. But we get a lot of local media attention as well. So that increases participation and awareness about some of these issues. So in, in these photos, you can see some of the events uh, where we bring the headsets to, to this uh, community meetings. Uh, and then you can see, you know, here on the top right, there's a, a Santa Cruz event. And the, the bottom right is a, a Turner Station in Maryland. The bottom left, it's uh, Alyssa there uh, when we were a community meeting in Long Beach showing some of the impacts and, and, and some solutions to the residents of the peninsula. We also had the experience live at the Santa Cruz Public Library. It was up for about 10 weeks. Over 400 participants uh, uh, came up and we had a mini survey at the end. And almost 80% said that, you know, going through the experience really increased their awareness of sea level rise. And Anna is going to talk a little bit about self-efficacy too, which is a great kind of uh, side, a good side effect of um, uh, just immersive tools. So that was my part. I am uh, going to hand it off to Paulo. He's going to talk a little bit about the technology. There's some nomenclatures that are important and, 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 and some things that are coming up. So let me stop sharing my screen. And Paulo, if you want to take it away. And if you want to also turn your camera on, that would be great. Thank you. Hello, guys. Can you guys see me? It's it's working all right. Yeah, I think we, we're good to go. All right, thank you. So hello guys, nice to talk to you guys. And I'm Paulo Salvatore, I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and it's really, I'm, really, I'm really excited to talk to you. And first of all, that's a picture of me in college, I graduated at Game Design College here in Sao Paulo and started to work a little bit with, with virtual reality, that this was my first project. Then I was invited to teach at the same college that I graduated from, so I started to share knowledge in Sao Paulo, a lot of people interested to hear about some of technology and 
all this cool stuff related to virtual reality and immersive technologies. But okay, uh, I'm saying immersive technologies and all these VR, AR, MR, XR terms. What is that exactly? Uh, the first one, virtual reality or VR, is when you replace this real world with digital content. Everything that you see is created and generated by computer, and you have these graphical designs and when the world is magical and can do a lot of cool stuff. The second one, AR, or augmented reality, is when you get this 2D real content and you use a camera from a smartphone or tablet or something, and you project a digital content on top of that so you can get pretty cool visuals and these two words kind of comb mixing together. If you combine VR and NR, you get MR or mixed reality, which mixed of them both. And you have you have these devices that you wear and you can see digital content. It's pretty more natural than the other two. And you can interact with that. So it's a really cool uh, result as well. And if you get these three terms, we have this XR or extended reality, which is an umbrella for VR, MR, and AR. And there are a lot of applications, and that's the immersive to immersive solutions. Uh, okay, everything seems great, but how can we apply that? That's the question that we ask uh, at Virtual Planet. Uh, as Juliano say, we started in 2018. Tech, virtual reality technology was just starting. We didn't know much back then. This first version of the Oculus, as you see on your left, and the cardboard version was made of paperboard, but technology was really just starting. And we started to take some 360 images, as Juliano also pointed out. And we started to think about, okay, how can we put all these great visuals and technology that we are working with uh, to connect with people and maybe tell them a story. Then this device came out, was July 2018. It was my first time in the USA, so I was really excited to travel outside Brazil. And then we, uh, me and Juliano spent like 10 days in his garage building a prototype to kind of putting all this technology together and maybe tell a story to people about what we were experiencing. Uh, and we started to take some looks about this new technology that was called photogametry. We also started to present, we presented that to the city of Santa Cruz. They really loved it. We also loved that. And we started looking for certain grants to tell more stories about different locations. So that's why we came up with all this. Uh, and the key find here was maybe it's not the technology about it, it's the, the technol about technology itself. We can use it to tell a story. So I think that's the most important part of that we find out. And Virtual Planet started as a tech company. We started building a lot of different technology devices and applications, but we realized that we are a storytelling company and we have to use all this technology to share stories, to connect with people. And the last thing that I want to point to you guys is that technology is a medium to support the process and you have to connect with people and you use all that in your favor. And next, we will hear from Anna Kiros. She's going to talk a little bit about her research at Stanford. And it's really cool how VR connects with education and environmental literacy. So thank you guys for having me and have a great day. Have a nice rest of the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Paulo. Let me share the slides. Thank you, Paulo. And thank you, Juliana, for sharing my screen now. Uh, the slides. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you all today and share some of our research here at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford. And um, just to give you some context, so I'm also from Brazil, so we have a very nice uh, cultural connection here as well. And um, I've been here at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab for the last three years, where I'm in charge of the educational, environmental educational projects. So um, we can go one slide, uh, Juliana, please. So that's the team 
um, we have Professor Jeremy Baleson, that's the uh, director of the lab, uh, Geraldine Fauville, that was a former uh, postdoc in the lab, and me, that I'm currently a postdoc in the lab as well. So we three uh, worked on these studies that, that I'm going to share with you today, and we have much more in the lab uh, website that you can uh, share. You can um, go and see the publications uh, later if you're interested in so we can go over more. So here uh, we have mainly three targets when uh, we conduct our research and we develop our experiences. So the first is to promote climate change awareness. So the Virtual Human Interaction Lab uh, has a nice relationship with other uh, departments at Stanford. So for example, the Center for Ocean Solutions, the Woods Institute, uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So we have mainly three experiences where we target climate change and we uh, worked in collaboration with experts, marine scientists to be sure that the science behind all these experiences are accurate and that we are truly showing what may become, uh, what's coming on and how it will affect several areas in the world. Our second target uh, for the environmental education projects is education. So how we can use VR to increase climate change awareness and also educate about it. Because when we talk about uh, climate change adaptation, uh, which talk mainly uh, on three aspects. So we have education is the first. So we have to know, you know, the basic concepts, what's going on in our environment to then plan what we can do to change. And after that, when we have a plan, when we understand what's going on, then we can actually take action in the environment and change our behavior. And finally, we have the new applications that um, we are always looking for how we can use new media to increase uh, pro-environmental behavior, uh, to promote climate change awareness, and to improve education, especially environmental education. And the next one. And um, one more, yes. So when we talk about climate change awareness, hope here are the pieces that we have. The first is the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience. This one is what we call a six degree of freedom experience. It means that you need the headset and the hand controllers, and then you can interact with the virtual world using the hand controllers. You can select objects, you can move them. And this is this kind of experience. It tracks your body movement. And this experience took more than two years to be developed and several iterations with uh, marine scientists here from Stanford. And uh, it has about six, seven minutes uh, long and shows how the ocean uh, will look like, especially in an area um, where ocean acidification increases. And then we have uh, decrease of marine life and how the ocean absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. So this experience was shown um, in several places to help uh, decision makers to plan next steps in terms of reducing CO2 emissions and reducing ocean acidification. Uh, for example, the US Senate here and also to the um, Palauan Congress. Also this experience, you can download it in several languages. We have this in French, Italian, Portuguese and more to come. And it was downloaded in more than a hundred countries so far. The second experience is um, the Crystal Reef. Uh, it was released on 2016. It's a 360 degree videos. It means that you don't need the hand controllers. You just uh, watch it with your um, headset. And as you move your head, the images are uh, rendered accordingly, and you can even watch it using your mobile phone. So this experience shows um, Dr. Fio Michelli, that is an expert, uh, marine expert here from Stanford. And she went and, um, to a special site in the coast of Italy, where we have this natural CO2 vents um, that spill CO2 to the um, ocean water and increases the acidity of this place. So those are real images where you can see on your left uh, healthy reef 
And then on your right, you can see the effects of the increased acidity on the ocean, creating this, what we call the uh, moonscape scenario, where um, there is very low biodiversity. And that could show us how the ocean would look like if we do not curb CO2 emissions. And finally, uh, we have coral compass. That's the experience that you're gonna see in a minute. And it was um, filmed in Palau, that's a um, natural island, um, island in Micronesia, where uh, V Hill team went there and they took these beautiful images. It's also a 360 video, so you can move around your head and see all around or use your phone to see the images. And it shows especially two things, how the government there is acting uh, to reduce the impacts of climate change there. And second, how the government is acting to reduce the impact of tourism on the coral reefs as well. So um, we can go one more. So for this video, we, are, uh, we have several ways for you to watch. One, if you have your mobile phone and you wanna watch and move around to see the scenario on your own, just um, target this QR code with your camera and go, um, go ahead. It will direct you to the YouTube video. Also, we are gonna share on the chat a link for that if you wanna use your computer. And finally, Julian is gonna share uh, the video live here. So if you do, just don't wanna um, follow the link and you just wanna share with us, watch with us. So, Julian, you can go ahead and share it. Thank you, Paulo, for sharing the uh, link. And I will just stop my video and mute myself so you can uh, sit, relax, and watch the experience. Thank you so much, Anna. And for the folks that are going to try on their own, either on the phone or on the video, we it takes about five and a half or six minutes. So if you do that and you mute the Zoom, uh, please be back in about six minutes at uh, one thirty-three or so, and then we'll, we'll 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 continue the conversation. But let me share. Carbon dioxide emissions are raising the temperature and acidity of our oceans. Coral reefs, home to one quarter of all known marine organisms, are particularly vulnerable. But this is not a story of despair. It is a story of adaptation. I'm Rob Dunbar, and I've spent 40 years studying coastal marine ecosystems around the world. Let's travel together to the Western Pacific island nation of Palau. Can you find Palau on the map? Numbering around 20,000, Palauans have little control over global carbon dioxide emissions. However, they are doing what they can to reduce damage to reefs by changing local policy. Today, we'll take a closer look at the impacts of tourism and land use practices. One of my favorite spots in Palau is Soft Coral Arch. Here, delicate soft corals grow in the shade of a shallow limestone arch. Take in the peace and quiet. Unfortunately, we seldom see soft coral arch like this, free from disturbance. Let me show you how it usually looks. Look above and around you. This beautiful sight draws large numbers of tourist boats every day. Observe how many of the tourists are swimming vertically instead of horizontally, kicking and damaging the corals with their fins. On the left side of the room is almost every Palauan senator. On the right are marine scientists, including me. To address some of the negative impacts of tourism, Palauan officials have introduced initiatives that will reduce the number of people at any given reef. But humans affect marine ecosystems, even if they never enter the water. Already weakened by climate change, nearshore reefs are more susceptible to damage when heavy rainfall on land carries sediments to the coastal ocean. 
As you look around, you'll notice that sediments reduce the clarity of the water, and there are few living corals and fish. Poor land use practices, such as eliminating the mangrove forests that run along the coastline, make the problem worse. Conversely, good farming practices can actually reduce the amount of sediment. This is a traditional Palauan taro farm. Scientists in Palau found that taro farms can reduce the amount of sediments in stormwater runoff by as much as 90%, acting like a sponge. They are working with land managers and farmers to strategically place farms in areas that will catch sediment before it reaches the ocean. In turn, the trapped sediments provide nutrients that help the taro grow. Now, look around. This reef is starting to recover. Trapping sediments in taro and in mangroves has a dramatic effect on the health of coastal reefs. Even when storms stir the sediments on land, the nearshore ocean waters are beautifully clear. These clear waters are ready to support healthy corals and vibrant populations of fish. Palauans are guardians of some of the world's most pristine and extensive coral reefs. Through careful management, they aim to better protect their reefs from damage caused by climate change. But we all have a role to play. Devastating events around the globe, droughts, flooding, wildfires, and sea level rise can all be linked to human-caused climate change. It's time for more countries to lead by example and enact policies that curb human impacts and protect the environment in our changing world. Now, take in the splendor of this wondrous planet we call home. Beautiful. Anna, do you want to uh, share your yeah. device? Yeah, there we go. Uh, um, wait another minute just to see if everyone, uh, for the folks that try it on their own. All right, I think we can uh, continue. <laughs> uh oh, looks like we lost, we may have lost Anna's uh, connection. Me. Okay, looks like we're having a little bit of a uh, technical uh, issue here with Anna. Uh, while I'm sure she's gonna reconnect at some point, but maybe we could uh, uh, move on to our next experience, which is 
uh, in Long Beach in California. I know Anna has a couple other findings from, from the studies that she mentioned that she wants to share with us. So hopefully she'll be able to rejoin uh, shortly. But uh, Alisa, do you wanna, do you mind uh, taking over and then um, talking a little bit about our project in Long Beach and the work at the Nature Conservancy? And then when uh, maybe Anna comes back uh, before we go to the wildfire, she could finish her, her piece. So that's all right. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear and see you okay. Okay, great. Good morning all or afternoon, uh, depending on where you are today. Uh, my name is Alyssa Mann uh, with the Nature Conservancy in California. And thanks so much for joining our session today. I'm thrilled to be able to share some of our work with virtual planet technologies to develop immersive experiences for some of our um, on the ground demonstration projects. My work on disaster resilience and climate adaptation is centered on working with California's high risk communities to prioritize natural infrastructure and conservation as we collectively prepare for a new climate reality. Part of that is figuring out how to communicate our work and figuring out what resonates with people to move them um, toward support for action on resilience. The question on engaging communities on a hot button issue like managed retreat is especially challenging. Uh, one that we've seen go wrong here in California many times. Uh, here at the Nature Conservancy, we know that in a highly urbanized place like California's coast, managed retreat will be necessary in some circumstances as seas rise and, and to be able to maintain our amazing coastal habitats and the benefits that they provide, uh, including flood protection. So the question we've been exploring for a little while now with, virtual, with the virtual planet team is, um, is virtual reality a powerful tool for engagement? Can it serve as a tool to catalyze community discussions around current and future risk? and be a powerful tool um, on engaging about options for long-term resilience, including um, controversial topics like managed retreat. We've done this in a few different locations. Uh, the first we'll share is the sea level rise explorer in Long Beach, and then the uh, wildfire explorer in Paradise, California. But we've also created experiences for a couple other projects, uh, including in Monterey Bay at Elkhorn Slough, uh, looking at nature-based adaptation options for transportation infrastructure. And then another one by our sister chapter for a coastal community in Maryland called Turner Station. And you can go check out Virtual Planet's website after to see um, some of those other ones as well. So first, uh, Long Beach. Uh, the goal of, of our work there um, and other places in California was to find ways of engaging um, residents that empower them to participate in the, in the design of future communities. We teamed up with uh, the Long Beach Aquarium of the Pacific, uh, a local partner with really deep community roots uh, in Long Beach uh, to shape a community dialogue around sea level rise and adaptation and the role of managed retreat in, in Cal one of California's largest coastal cities, Long Beach. We really embraced the idea that critical to this uh, process is hearing directly from the impacted population uh, so we can better understand uh, residents' uh, concerns about the future of the area, their perspectives on potential scenarios, including the possibility for managed retreat down the line. So we convened a, a series of seminars and listening sessions. And part of that project was co-developing a virtual reality experience to visualize sea level rise impacts and potential solutions. The purpose of the VR was not to scare people, uh, but to create realistic understanding of the issue and to show solutions of what might be possible. By co-developing, this meant we showed community members and local residents in, in hazard areas, as well as decision makers, this experience while we were developing it and taking input and feedback along the way. So I'm gonna mention a couple of things we learned along the way uh, before we show it to you. Uh, first, uh, VR really makes visible the impacts of sea level rise that was missing in viewing two-dimensional maps of, um, of impacts, and this is something that um, Giuliano talked a little bit about at the beginning. Participants shared with us that um, after seeing the virtual reality experience, they said it, it felt really very much more realistic and that it made more of an impact on them um, than seeing uh, paper maps. So next is critical to go beyond visualizing risk and to show and discuss solutions. Um, showing sea level rise impacts alone 
might not be effective at promoting discussion and dialogue around the options for action. And then uh, developing the scenarios to show uh, particularly controversial scenarios like managed retreat is, is super challenging. And to be honest, the jury is still out on this question, partly because COVID uh, really slowed us down in being able to share the final product with the community, but also that it's really hard to show. Uh, many adaptation plans right now are focused on near-term options without detail about what long-term solutions might look like. And th the team really found it um, found that developing conceptual renderings of long-term adaptation solutions that sort of appropriately balanced uh, realistic options as well as visionary concepts, that was um, super challenging. Next, that message and framing are in some ways just as important as the technical aspects of VR. Uh, the team was surprised by the amount of effort uh, and time went into developing the script for the voiceovers and gathering and integrating feedback from partners and stakeholders. And often it was Paolo and the team uh, of technical developers that were waiting for us um, to move forward in the process. And since the goal was really a community driven process, you know, how critical it was to take the time necessary to share and gut check direction often um, and to be flexible when changes needed to be made. And finally, that VR seems to be most effective when coupled with facilitated dialogue and discussion. In feedback, participants shared uh, that the VR and the conversation, uh, conversations to follow were highlights of the forums and focus groups. Um, one uh, participant commented that the casual open forum made a really difficult subject more palatable. Again, the importance of narrative framing, effective facilitation, and creating a space for dialogue can't be overstated. We still have a lot to learn here, um, so hoping that down the road we'll be able to do some social science research to test some of um, you know, these lessons that are, are more anecdotal right now and hypotheses, but, but see if they um, really hold true um, through research. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Giuliano and Paolo to, to, um, to direct you and share the experience. All right, thank you so much, Alyssa. This has uh, been a really interesting project and uh, looking forward to talking a little bit more about it on the Q&A and, and looking forward for uh, some of the questions. So for this experience, let me put a, uh, I put a, a, a Vimeo link on the chat. So again, I will play the video here for us. So if you wanna stick around for this one, this is not a, a, a 360 experience in, the, uh, in this video but it will soon be available for uh, download at the, the Oculus store. So let me share my screen. And this is about maybe just seven minutes um, long. Uh, and here we go. Welcome to the Scene Level Rise Explorer, Long Beach. It's great to have you here. This experience was developed to illustrate the potential impacts of climate change on coastal communities and possible solutions. We hope this experience will help support the community's conversation about how to adapt to a changing climate. The burning of coal, oil, and natural gas all produce greenhouse gases that form a blanket around the Earth. This blanket traps heat causing global temperatures to rise, which can intensify severe weather patterns, but also cause glaciers and ice sheets to melt, seawater to expand, which both raise sea levels. These changes will create major disruptions for our planet and impact coastal communities in many ways. Long Beach is a vibrant and diverse community with a rich history. Residents and visitors enjoy its coastal areas and beaches for a variety of recreational activities. This low-lying area will experience rising sea levels and possibly increased storms, causing more frequent and intense coastal flooding, beach erosion, and eventually permanent inundation by ocean waters in some areas. This could impact coastal property, infrastructure, public safety, and access to these amazing coastal resources. In this model, you can see the entire peninsula, a mile-long stretch of coast developed in the early 1900s and a popular beach for locals and visitors. Go ahead and click on the Extreme Storm button on the screen. See that water filling in? Even under current conditions, an extreme storm could cause significant flooding in this area. 
Now, as we return the model to current sea levels, select the circle on the left side of the scale in front of you and drag it slowly to your right to visualize the impacts of sea level rise in this area. As you drag the circle to the right, you will see a projection of nearly one foot to just under five feet of sea level rise. While we are uncertain when sea level rise will reach specific levels, it could reach five feet by the end of the century. Without action, permanent inundation is expected to happen much sooner. Let's take a closer look at some parts of the peninsula. See the flashing target on your left? Click there. In this model, you can see the northwesternmost part of the peninsula under current sea levels. You can see the Sailing Center, Ocean Boulevard, and the start of the famous Sea Sidewalk Boardwalk. Drag the circle to the right to see what could happen to the neighborhood under various projected sea level rise scenarios. Click on the flashing target on the left to look at Alamitos Park. Alamitos Park sits at the end of the peninsula, overlooking the entrance to Alamitos Bay, a popular boating area. In this model, you can see the tracks from trucks that regularly move the sand from one side of the beach to the other. As you drag the slider to the right, Note the vegetated dunes and the jetty that help protect the local beach. Have you ever been in a blimp before? Click the target on your lower left to get an aerial view of the Long Beach Peninsula. Welcome to the Virtual Planet Blimp. You're floating high above the peninsula, overlooking Alamitos Bay. Take a moment to look around you and get your bearings. You can see the community of Naples in front of you, Belmont Shores to the left, and Seal Beach in Orange County to your right. Go ahead, click on the Extreme Storm button on the screen to again see what the projected impacts of an extreme storm could look like today. Even under current conditions, an extreme storm would cause significant flooding in this area. Now, as we return the model to current sea levels, Select the circle on the left side of the scale in front of you and drag it slowly to your right. As you slide the circle, you can see projected impacts of nearly one foot and five feet of sea level rise with no storm. While we know that sea levels are rising and will eventually inundate this area, we don't know exactly when. So what can be done in Long Beach to protect the community from these impacts? Click on Solutions. The city is developing its first ever climate action and adaptation plan to help the community reduce greenhouse gas emissions and prepare for the impacts of climate change. Climate adaptation is about science, but it also requires vision and imagination. In the scene that follows, you'll see one possible adaptation vision for this area that is imaginary but based on probable flooding projections. Click on Near Term to see what could be done in the next several decades. There are some things we can do in the near term to keep people in their homes as long as possible without limiting our options for the future. One option is to add more sand to the beach and consider hard structures to keep the beach in place for as long as possible. Further, vegetated sand dunes with designated access points can protect homes in place while also providing additional habitat and recreation opportunities for locals and visitors. However, this solution would not provide protection long term. As sea levels continue to rise, low-lying areas may be permanently underwater. When you are ready, click on Home to return to the beach house. In the long run, the community may choose to relocate infrastructure to get people out of harm's way as sea levels rise, ensuring a long beach with abundant coastal access, more biodiverse and resilient, and safer for the community. The goal of this project is to start a dialogue to ensure we can implement near-term solutions and plan for a just and smooth transition at the best possible time, minimizing financial and emotional impacts to the community. Stay tuned for the next phase of this virtual reality project when we visualize long-term solutions for the community. 
Thank you for using the Sea Level Rise Explorer Long Beach. To learn more about this immersive experience and coastal resilience, visit our websites, nature.org, coastalresilience.org, and virtualplanet.tech. All right. Uh, okay, and um, I think we can. Uh, we have a, maybe a minute or two. At least I don't know if you have other remarks that you want to make yeah. after we, we we went through the experience, or maybe take a couple questions. Yeah, I mean, I can address this one question I see here um, uh, about: Is there a long-term solution projection yeah. as well? Um, one other thing I'll say is that. Um, when we released this first version of um, this experience uh, was right at the start of, of um, the pandemic. And so we have been developing um, some long-term solutions to be able to add to them, but haven't had a chance to test those in the community yet. And so, um, you know, definitely, you know, we, we like I mentioned before, um, that thinking through what to visualize for managed retreat is, is um, something that's been hotly debated uh, with our team, uh, but we are hoping that down the road we're going to be able to test some preliminary images and get feedback from the community and then refine. Um, so this was sort of a first start and and hopefully going down the road later. So. You on mute here. Yeah, just to add to that, just a, a, a quick shout out to John Luca. He's our uh, artist behind those amazing visuals, and he's been working on. You know, there's a this amazing image of the the peninsula. What it would look like if we restore it to a wetland and things like that. But as we all know, here it's like we have to be kind of mindful and careful on how we present this information to the public, and it's going to be done in like a, a, a thoughtful way. And and, and there's some questions there on you know still unanswered on what's the best way to do that so uh this is open Juliana, there's another question that's probably to you yeah 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 uh yes so the way that the, the our projects work is that we we develop it with our partners on the ground and once they're uh done the applications are all available for free so you can access them. This uh, Long Beach will be available in VR, also on mobile, so iOS and Android, and on a website too. We'll, we'll post links uh, towards the end as well, so where you can find more about it. So before I jump into the Paradise uh, example, do we want to go back to Anna um, for yeah, a few minutes and then? Okay. Good idea, Anna. Thanks for uh, joining back. Uh, uh, do you wanna? Do you want me to share the slides for you, or you wanna take it over and just run with them? I can share the slides, and I'm sorry, my internet was down for some minutes. Thank you for uh, taking over, Alyssa. And um, it's amazing the work in Long Beach. So um, and it will work now. So we applied our VR experiences at schools. Uh, for education, and then I want to share with you some of what we found. So, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can see you, the screen, and hear you well. So, okay, great. So, um, so when I joined the lab two years ago, and I saw these beautiful experiences, and um, you know how VR was being used with decision makers and with the community, my first question was. Wow, so if we compare VR to what we are used to that are computer monitors, what would be the associations, right, between these 360 videos and conceptual knowledge and self-efficacy? So this main question we had, uh, it's important to define conceptual learning. So when we are talking about climate change and the effects of you know, CO2 emissions in the ocean, we are talking about uh, new information that just uh, we found that just a small percent of the adults actually know what ocean acidification is, for example, and, and it's a concept. Um, so I wanted to understand better how using VR would help uh, people to get this new information at what they already know to create this new concept. So that's why we call conceptual learning. That's different from procedural learning. So for example, you may have seen VR being used for um, surgical training 
or you know, uh, training some movements, those are procedural uh, learning aspects. Here we are focused more on the conceptual aspect of it. And on self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is a concept that has been coined more than 40 years ago and has been shown to be positively associated with uh, academic performance and even uh, professional performance. So self-efficacy is how much someone feels that they are able to learn, how they can uh, master some content, how they can uh, be good at something. So that's um, the main concept of self-efficacy. And then we wanted to understand if there is any difference on learning and uh, self-efficacy when we compare VR to a computer monitor. So for that, we um, had um, hundreds of middle school students here from California, and we uh, split the group into two groups. So the desktop condition using a computer monitor and the VR group using the headsets to watch Coral Compass that you have just watched it before and the Crystal Reef. So both of them tapping into um, climate change issues and impacts on the ocean. So um, we measured learning. So how much they learned before and after, um, after the experience self-efficacy and presence. So presence is this feeling that we are in the virtual environment. And it's an important measure to understand if the immersion caused by the headset was able to make them feel that they were actually in that environment. So um, we had students answering this pre-test with questions about ocean acidification, uh, measures to help mitigate ocean acidification and so on, before having the experience, three weeks before, and also questions about self-efficacy, how much they would put, how much effort they would put to learn difficult uh, concepts and so on. Uh, three weeks after, so they we have this uh, both groups. Here, the picture you can see was actually the place that the VR group experienced VR with those headsets. And um, we had another group just using their own computer. After having the first experience that could be Coral Compass or Crystal Reef, they would answer the learning questions and self-efficacy questions. They would have the other video and then answer again the questionnaire and by the end the presence questions. And what we found was that for learning, uh, we got similar results between groups. Uh, both groups learned a lot with the experience. So they, uh, we found a significant difference between pre-test and post-test. Um, but between groups, the learning was pretty much the same. Uh, but when we talk about self-efficacy, we found that students that use the VR headset, they reported a higher score. So they were saying that they were they felt more able to learn about ocean acidification and climate change issues. And then we um, run the second study where we had a larger sample. This time we had uh, students from sixth to eighth grade. And uh, we also added a delayed post-test. So I wanted to understand if this effect that we found on self-efficacy would persist six weeks after having the experience. And then we had the same um, results as the first study for learning. Students learned a lot. Um, there was no difference between groups for the multiple choice questions assessing learning. But for the open-ended, where they were able to, you know, to write their opinions and uh, expand more on what they learned, we found that students in VR, they scored higher than students on the uh, desktop condition. And we found that there was no significant effect for self-efficacy six weeks after. Although this effect was also found immediately after having the experience, as we found on study one, six weeks after we didn't have this um, difference between groups for self-efficacy. What um, gives us the sense that probably um, to be an effective behavior change or and sustained self-efficacy change, we could plan more um, often experiences than only maybe once a month, 
for example. But we need to, that's a future research that we are looking into and to find exactly what would be the frequency ideal for maintaining these results that we found. And um, also we wanted to hear from marine educators, what would be the challenges that they face to teach ocean acidification and how VR could help them to address those challenges. So uh, we run this qualitative study uh, mixed with some uh, quantitative data as well, where first we uh, shared a survey with the marine educators communities. So we shared online and they, um, were able to tell us what would be the challenges they face to teach about ocean acidification. After that, we categorized all the answers. We had more than 269 um, challenges here, and we um, put them in under 21 categories. After that, we sent again one um, online survey and asked ask the marine educators to score those challenges, what would be the most important challenges that they think would be important to address and so on. And we ended up with the seven more uh, relevant challenges for them, where we had in the um, National Marine um, Educators Association Conference, uh, we had a workshop there and educators could experience the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience, the one that you use your headset and you can move around uh, the objects and you, and you experience how the ocean floor will look like um, if we keep the CO2 rates. And then after having this VR experience, we asked them um, to give us um, options and tell us how they think VR could help to address those challenges. And here are, come, here are the results. First, for challenges, the four, um, we could find these four things that the challenges could be grouped uh, into. First, they report that the students come um, with a lack of science literacy. So for example, to understand about ocean acidification, it's important to understand some chemical um, concepts that students didn't have this mastered at the point and it was a challenge for them to teach ocean acidification because of that. Um, they also reported that educators um, could receive more training. So they felt that they could be better prepared to teach about ocean acidification. Also, uh, because ocean acidification is an invisible and complex concept and it takes a long time to see any results in the environment, it's difficult to teach about it because the students don't feel like it's an actual issue right now. And um, finally, just a small amount of the students actually have a connection to the ocean or live on the coast. So that was also something, it was you know, uh, far from the site uh, for them to really see this um, issue. And then when we think about VR and all the experiences that you have seen, like Carl Compass, the Long Beach experience, where students, they are able to actually feel the environment. And we found, found that, you know, on our presence measures that students in VR, they actually felt that they were in that environment um, significantly more than students that were on their computers. We found that VR can bring them empowerment. It means that they can um, see how um, these changes, the climate change will impact the daily lives of the community around that area. Um, also, it helps them to take this perspective taking. Um, so how life would be when um, all these projections really come true and how um, the marine life will be affected uh, by ocean acidification. And finally, they can visualize the chemical process. And that's what uh, Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience does. Like you can see these molecules coming from the atmosphere and being absorbed by the ocean and reacting with the water and increasing the acidity of the ocean. So they can definitely have a more concrete experience of something that's very abstract. So um, 
from these three studies, studies what we have as overall conclusions. First, uh, VR can be a powerful tool to support environmental education. Um, it has been shown to increase self-efficacy. Um, it can um, support learning process that regular and traditional media cannot. And also, uh, the question of being able to simulate new scenario, to be able to be on the shoes of people that is directly affected by climate change is a powerful um, tool that we are allow us to have. So that's what uh, I brought for you today about our studies. We have others, but I'm happy to share with you later, or you just visit our website to download the papers. And I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, Juliana, I'm not sure if I'm answering the questions right now, or if you wanted to do it by the end. I think we have a, maybe a minute to, if there are any uh, quick pressing questions, we could just monitor in here. It doesn't seem like there's anything on the Q&A, but thank mm -hmm. you so much. And it was uh, amazing work and the findings are, uh, uh, th they kind of match what we're seeing on, on events and then we talk with people, but it's great to see, you know, the, the backing of the research showing that, that you know, mm -hmm. that's happening too. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end as well, so people have another opportunity to ask questions. Uh, I think now we, we're kind of changing settings a little bit, and we're gonna talk about the wildfire uh, problem, which is uh, this experience we developed in a partnership with the Nature Conservancy and the Paradise uh, Recreation and, uh, and Parks Districts, uh, showing you know, a different kind of facet of you know, managed retreat to come and how we can maybe use nature even to to protect communities. So at least I'll let you speak to it and then I'll share the, the link and the video with, with participants. Okay, great. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can see and hear. Okay, you. great. So this VR experience was developed to support a project in Paradise, California, which is in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Um, as many of you likely remember, the town of Paradise was decimated by the campfire in 2018, which killed at least 85 people and destroyed 90% of the town's home. And then just two years later, the town was threatened again by the Bear Fire. In 2020, nearly 10,000 wildfires burned more than four and a half million acres across California in what has been widely reported as a record setting year. Following the campfire tragedy, uh, looking for more innovative strategies for a more resilient paradise was definitely on the top of mind for the community and its leaders. With the town's future in mind, representatives from the Paradise Recreation and Park District collaborated with the Nature Conservancy and the Conservation Biology Institute to examine how uh, well a community encircling buffer zone around the, per the perimeter of paradise might reduce fire risk to the town as a whole. Think of it like dispensable space, but instead of for a home, for the whole community. Uh, the buffer would be created through the acquisition of select parcels or easements for management deemed at high risk for ignition in a wildfire. This is a newer area for the Nature Conservancy. Much of our work on fire resilient strategies tend to focus on wildland areas and forest management rather than sort of these community, community scale specific strategies for resi fire resilience. The science is, is definitely still developing and solutions are being looked at and, and uh, tested. But again, uh, we need communication and engagement tools um, in parallel to show um, risks and solutions. So the Wildfire Explorer for Paradise uh, immerses the user in the fire uh, with the ability to rapidly change scale. Um, the tool can take a user from the forest floor view to a satellite view. And this is really critical for visualizing the impacts of mega fires, which can be so intense and far flung. Wildfire behavior is also you know, fundamentally pretty mysterious to most people. Um, the VR experience can show how physical, logical, and geographic features on the landscape can influence the spread of a blaze and help illuminate how and why some solutions work or, or don't work. Existing risk reduction measures are critical, but aren't really being fully utilized. Uh, but likely they won't be enough. So 
So introducing communities to both the myriad of things that they can do, um, perhaps at their home, um, in their neighborhood, but also introduce new approaches that can be applicable in, the, in their community as well as other places. Um, millions of Californians already live in the wildland urban interface or WUI areas um, with more development being planned. We will need to learn to live with fire and um, kind of like sea level rise, start a community dialogue on how and where development happens, um, really land use planning and potentially constraining development in some of these very high risk um, fire zones. And again, the tool, you know, we're trying to understand if VR is the tool that may able, be able to help start that dialogue. So I'm gonna turn it back to Giuliano to share it. Great, thank you so much, Alisa. I'm gonna put the, the link here on the chat for the experience. I do have a little uh, uh, warning uh, disclaimer here because one of the things that we talk with the folks in Paradise, and I think that's part of the VR, right? I think uh, Jeremy Balenson that Anna mentioned at the beginning has this little test. Not everything should be done in VR, but there are some things that, 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 that should, and, and, and it's helpful to do that. And one of the things, one of his task criteria is that situations that are dangerous. So in the simulation, you will see you'll be put in a forest and there's going to be this wildfire blaze that comes toward you. Uh, it doesn't get to you. We stop it before. But there are some folks, especially here in California, that have experienced such uh, uh, events. So just a, a warning to folks, if you, you know, if you find yourself in that situation, you don't want to see it, just uh, uh, turn away for the first like two minutes of the video and then uh, rejoin us. So here is the link. Uh, to Vimeo, it's a 360 experience. So again, you can click and, and, and drag it around. This one is a little longer. It's about 12 minutes uh, long. So if you're going to do it on your own, maybe we can regroup at in, in about 12 minutes or so. And let me share the screen here. Welcome to the Wildfire Explorer. It's great to have you here. Following a familiar warming trend, August of 2020 was California's warmest on record. In early September, more than 3 million acres in the state had burned and more than 14,000 firefighters were on the line of 29 major wildfires. 2018 was one of the worst years for wildfires in California's history. More than 1 million acres burned and more than 100 people have died. Touch the virtual planet hologram to start the experience. Out there through the trees, something has sparked a flame and it's starting to spread fast. With this dry forest, there's abundant fuel to carry the flames and with strong winds, the trees themselves will quickly catch fire. Under these conditions, a wildfire is incredibly difficult to contain and can quickly become an extremely dangerous firestorm. Wildfires represent an increasing danger due to our planet's warming climate and changing rainfall patterns. This experience will share the story of the most destructive and deadly wildfire in California's history and a few strategies that can help reduce fire risks at our communities in the future. This is a 3D model of Butte County, the town of Paradise and surrounding areas. Following several years of drought and many days of extremely dry weather and strong easterly winds, a fire started on a hillside in Polga. This was an electric fire caused by lack of maintenance on power lines from PG&E that broke away from a 99-year-old electric tower. PG&E, the nation's largest electricity provider, pled guilty to 84 counts of manslaughter in the campfire case and is facing bankruptcy. When you're ready, touch the hologram to see a simulation of that tragic day's events. This wildfire, infamously known as the Camp Fire, was the costliest and most deadly in the history of the state.
you can now see the scorched earth left after the campfire was contained, almost three weeks after it started. The burn scar spans 154,000 acres, an area bigger than Chicago. Now we'll slow it down for you. Touch the hologram to watch a more detailed timeline of the day that the campfire burned down paradise. At 6.29 a.m. on November 8, 2018, the fire begins. The sparks ignited the dry foliage and the flames expanded rapidly toward Paradise, seven miles away. At 7.57 a.m., the first order to evacuate parts of Paradise was issued. At 8 a.m., a dozen spot fires started in Paradise, caused by fire embers carried from miles away by the strong winds. Staff start evacuating children at local schools. At 9.17 a.m., a, a full-scale evacuation order for Paradise was issued. The rate of growth and speed that the flames traveled surprised first responders and wildfire experts. By noon, nearly 90% of the town had been consumed by the fire, only six hours from when the fire started. At times, the flames consumed the equivalent area of one football field per second. By 7 p.m., the fire had consumed nearly 60,000 acres. By the end of the day, the fire reached Highway 99, nearly 18 miles from Polga. Ultimately, 50,000 people evacuated from Paradise and the surrounding areas. The fire was finally contained three weeks later. When you're ready, touch the hologram to learn about the far-reaching impacts of the campfire. One out of every three houses in California, more than four million homes, are located in areas of high fire risk. These areas are known as the wildland urban interface, places where natural land transitions into the developed areas. While these are beautiful places to call home, the fire is always a concern. The red dots on the map represent more than 17,000 structures destroyed by the fire. It took just six hours for the fire to devastate the entire town. Ultimately, 85 people were killed. Damages from the campfire totaled more than $16 billion. That would have been enough money to purchase more than 53,000 homes in Butte County earlier that year. That included $6 billion in insurance claims. A year and a half after the fire, many people who once called Paradise home had left. The population decreased from 26,000 in 2018 to just 2,000 residents in 2020. With the majority of the population from Paradise becoming effectively homeless over the course of a single day, 20,000 fire refugees fled to the nearby cities of Chico, Orville, and other locations where local residents provided shelter. In only 10 hours, the local population of Chico grew from 92,000 to 102,000 people. Cities need decades to plan for such tremendous growth. Overnight, the sewer system started processing an extra 1 million gallons per day. A year after the fire, city officials said they still needed half a billion dollars to improve infrastructure and hire additional police officers and firefighters to support the higher population. The air quality was compromised as far as Sacramento and the San Francisco Bay Area, almost 200 miles away from the original source of the fire. Across Northern California, air quality was deemed unhealthy to breathe with special concerns for people with respiratory diseases and disproportionately harming the elderly, low-income people of color, and children. More than one million kids from schools across the state had to stay home for weeks. An uptick in ER visits related to the fire-caused air pollution occurred even three months after the fire was fully contained. Now the community of Paradise must rebuild, and with that comes a new vision for wildfire safety, disaster preparedness, and a new understanding of what a warming climate means for woodland towns. When you're ready, touch the hologram to learn about potential solutions to prevent future tragedies like the campfire. Let's face it, we can't just rebuild things as they were. There are better, safer ways to rebuild communities such as Paradise that not only reduce future fire risks, but also provide additional conservation recreation, and economic benefits. And being proactive really pays off. While preparation actions cost millions of dollars, recovery efforts cost billions. 
The long-term community recovery plan developed for Paradise outlines 21 opportunities to make the community safer, more welcoming, stronger, better, and greener. Now, we'll show you a few strategies to rebuild Paradise in a safer way from the community to the individual house. Maintaining a multi-use open spaces around communities, maintaining defensible spaces around the neighborhoods and individual lots, and hardening homes and early warning systems. Using fire-resistant materials and maintaining defensible space around buildings and fire-safe landscaping are also critical to reduce fire risks to structures. Current laws require 100 feet of defensible space with specific vegetation management requirements in that area. Examples of required actions include maintaining clean roofs and gutters and removing vegetation that could catch fire from around and under decks. Requirements also include removing dead plants and leaves and maintaining at least 10 feet between tree crowns. Many roads in Paradise were designed as long dead-end streets or cul-de-sacs off of a main road. During the campfire evacuation, gridlock traffic stalled the residents from getting out as the blaze bore down on the town. Roads funneled evacuees all into similar routes, slowing and even halting their exit forcing more than 120 residents to seek shelter in the burning town. In rebuilding Paradise's roadways, special care will need to be taken in developing fast, clear evacuation routes. Implementing open space around urban areas can also provide a safety buffer to protect structures and lives. These areas can be used as parks with bike and hiking trails and picnic areas while providing a safer distance between structures and the vegetation in the wildland urban interface. One approach is to avoid new construction in certain areas and convert empty lots into resilience parks, which can act as buffers to reduce fire risks and at the same time make Paradise a more attractive travel destination to locals and visitors. Unfortunately, unless things change rapidly, such destructive fires are likely to become even more common. Halfway through the 2020 fire season, wildfires had burned over 3.1 million acres in California. The annual burned area has increased more than fivefold since the 1970s. As the climate continues to warm, by 2100, there could be a 77% increase in the total number of acres burned in California every year. The memory of the campfire is already evolving into a story of innovation, strength, and resilience. Paradise endured a brutal blow from the campfire. The road to recovery will take years and billions of dollars, but with support from state and federal governments, the private sector, and NGOs, the town is starting to redevelop and transform itself. We hope this virtual reality experience has provided you with new insights on wildfire safety and the urgent need to reduce fire risks in a warming climate. Thank you for joining us. All right, so that was wildfire experience. So many parallels, right, with the, when we talk about managed retreat on coast, coastal areas and even more, pre I think, oppressing because it, it's already happening in, in some cases. But this idea, I, I just watching, I've, I've seen this many times, but every time, it, you know, it, it, it brings something up. And, and this time I'm thinking of, you know, that issue of receiving communities and how you're going to, you know, where, where are people going to go? Where can they go? And also this issue of unmanaged retreat, right? If we don't plan the things, they're going to happen anyway. So how do we prepare for them? So um, thank you, Alyssa, for introducing that. I don't know, Alyssa, if you have any comments uh, that you want to do. I don't see any questions on the, on the Q&A, but maybe we can alter our cameras and just uh, have a quick uh, panel discussion. I have a couple of things I could, I'd like to ask you guys, but uh, also looking forward for the audience. Uh, if anyone has other questions we have you know about five or six minutes uh, there maybe just give a second no okay uh so i 
Oh, and, uh, just a, a, a shout out for Joel Hirsch, who is the voiceover for the Paradise uh, uh, film. He's from uh, uh, Santa Cruz here too, with the Swan Dive Media. And one of the other questions that uh, sometimes people ask is uh, related to how much this uh, experiences cost and how long it takes to develop them. And I just want to say it, it really varies. We have this, uh, we're a mission driven kind of organization here. So we work with any budget like the Paradise was completely done for uh, pro bono. So it, we, we try to work with, you know, uh, important issues around uh, climate change and adaptation. So. Uh, and it was the, uh, I just realized this was the, the official launch of this film in, in the US. We had it screened at a film festival in Brazil in December, but it's the first time that's going to be now public. So uh, I'm happy to, to share that with you. So, uh, no, oh, there's one question. Just wondering which locations are you looking to simulate next? So you're mostly working with the Okay, great. I can take that question real quick. So we, we're working, uh, we're, we're kind of branching out a little bit. Uh, we're working with the city of Cleveland at the moment uh, on uh, urban heat uh, uh, island effect. So looking at how green corridors could ameliorate, you know, uh, heat, uh, mental health, physical health, and, and with an equity lens as well. Uh, we're also working to uh, starting up pretty soon uh, a project with the city uh, uh, West Palm Beach and Florida Atlantic University. And we're working uh, with a project in California, which is a, a class for kids 12 to up to 17. It's going to be in VR and that's related to marine protected areas. It's been a super fun project to work on where we have an animated uh, sea lion. We call her Marina and she's going to teach the kids. There's a scavenger hunt in there. So we're that's kind of uh, what's coming next. So, um, I don't know, Alisa, you want to take Serena's uh, question about the paradise? Sure. Um, yeah, so the question is, um, what audience do you envision for the project? What surprises you, did you encounter for the project? Um, you know, one of the things, you know, this is a pretty novel idea to think about doing a uh, resilience park or a, a um, multi-benefit buffer around a community um, and something that they're thinking about in other communities too that haven't experienced, um, you know, the, the level of an event that Paradise experienced. And so I think that there's definitely an opportunity to have this discussion with other communities that have significant population within the wildland urban air interface. Um, and so we're starting to have those discussions um, with other communities here in California, um, particularly um, in Northern California. Uh, so, you know, I do think there's opportunities, certainly um, with decision makers, um, state legislatures who, who might have um, looking at investing quite a bit of money in, in fire resilient strategies here in the state. And so I think that that's a big opportunity. You know, like Giuliano said, um, you know, having this be a, an experience, particularly for paradise comes with a lot of tricky, um, you know, there's, there's harm that can be done by having people re uh, experience this. And so again, how important it is to be really careful about how we, um, how we share it and, and um, how it is important it is to tell people, um, you know, that, that disclaimer at the front that Giuliano did. Um, and, you know, honestly, it's funny because I, I watched this, um, this is the first time I watched it after the 2020 uh, year where I even had to evacuate my home down in Southern California and it was, it hit me in a different way. And so, um, yeah, it's, I think what's really interesting about these experiences are some of the emotions that it brings up. Um, so how important it is that you don't just do this in a vacuum, that there is discussion and um, opportunities um, to sort of reflect on what you uh, what you see. So, Julian, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. Well, just uh, 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 one surprise is that we're really reluctant with that first scene where the forest, uh, you know, fire appears. But we, I was kind of surprised that folks from Paradise, like, no, we want to keep that in there because you can't imagine what it's like if you haven't seen one and we want and we need people to really see it. And that's one of the powers, I think, of, of VR. So one of the audiences uh, we talked about, those before the pandemic, we're just restarting that conversation with the town now. 
but there's going to be a film festival in in paradise uh, in september so we're gonna uh, i think we're gonna be part of that that event and also we wanted to take this to um sacramento to to you know our, our, our policy makers here because one of the messages like it takes millions to prepare for those things but it really takes billions and, and many lives to to recover from them so that was another uh, then, uh, sorry, uh, Janelle has a question about the school facilities impacted by the fire. Yeah, it was, there's, there's some documentaries online, they're heartbreaking, but there's one about this bus full of kids that evacuated from the school and they just couldn't leave. They had to shelter in place and find and their struggle to get out. They all made it okay, but it was, yeah, it, the, the whole town was, was, was devastated by there, by that, by that event. And, um, and there's a, a question here, I think, Anna, that you, you know about the sample size for students on your climate education survey. Yeah, so we used to have at least 30 students um, as a rule of thumb for um, as a sample size. But uh, we, on the second study, we had 139 students. So we had almost 70 students on each group because we wanted to see how the findings would be if they would sustain with a larger sample and then it did so wonderful well i i think this is our time i'm sorry i'd love to stay longer and, and talk about this more i really appreciate you know the panel Alisa and, and and paulo for joining us this is i've been looking forward to this panel for for a long time so i'm very happy and everything worked out thank you for the participants uh, people that attended. This is being recorded, so if you if you think of someone that could benefit from from hearing about this, please send them over, and please be in touch. We we enjoy talking about this and learning about communities and and, and looking for our next partners and and projects. So thank you.